9, 12, 10, 28, 2, 23. This is Deep State Radio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. It's that time of the week when we talk about what's going on in politics, what's going on with the campaign. Uh, uh, 32 days away, I guess, uh, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, so uh, things are heating up and uh, we've got the three best people I know to talk about it. Um, uh, we have our friend Tara McGowan, who runs Courier Newsrooms. Uh, how are you doing, Tara? Hey, David. Doing well. We've got uh, Democratic uh, strategist Tom Bonnier. How are you doing, Tom? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're declining here. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little afraid then to say. Yeah. And then we've got Simon Rosenberg, who uh, runs the Hopium Chronicle. So, though, you know, Simon, uh, yesterday or I, I think or this morning, I was trying to listen to your video uh, on the Hopium Chronicles, and you set it up nicely with. Uh, 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 subtitles, but every time you refer to the Hopium Chronicles, your subtitle refers to the Opium Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this is something happening? Uh, should, should... Si- Simon's happening. breaking back. No, I'm just <laughs> that point in the cycle. I I remain un uh, unapologetically optimistic about what's going to happen over these next thirty plus days, David. Well, okay, well let's talk about that. Let's each one of you spend a couple minutes telling us what, where you think we are right now. Uh, and I'm going to start with Tara, and I'll go around just as I did the intros. You start with me? I'm yeah. Not, well, I guess that's fair, because mine's anecdotal, because I don't look at the data like Simon and Tom, <laughs> so you can get more of a, a data-driven response. Um, I, I am uh, cautiously optimistic. I am feeling more nervous as we get closer, but that's kind of par for the course in this work. Uh, Tom and I were talking a little bit right before we started uh, the show about how 32 feels really long for folks like us that have been in this. I think others feel that way, too. We're ready to tie this up. But people are voting. Um, I actually think that the VP debate, if it mattered at all, was not negative, but a positive um, in certain ways. I'm sure we're going to get into that. But yeah, this is the this is sort of the the nail biting. Do all of the things every day you know, feel like you're not doing enough and do more period of time. So that's, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm tired, hopeful, and also very clear eyed that there's a lot of work still left to do. Okay. Well, Tom, that didn't comfort me one bit. <laughs> um, just, it just, jump in then. I mean, yeah, so to give us some of those bonnier nuggets that we always like where everybody's looking at the polls and you're looking at some secret stash of data <laughs> that you found in the parked van along the side of the road someplace. Who what, told you? <laughs> so so, so where, at, where are you? Yeah. And I'll leave the polls to Simon because he's he's an expert on, on, on that. But in terms of the data you talk about, the voter registration data and now the early vote data, which I'll get to in a second, because we're on this like exciting moment where we actually are beginning to have some data to look at there. But voter registration data, you know, we've been talking about on here how we saw this great increase of voter registrations, especially m- among young women of color uh, right after Vice President Harris became the nominee. And so the good news there is, even though that was a big spike that lasted about a week and it dropped back down, the numbers have still been above the baseline among those voters. Then we saw the second spike after the presidential debate and the Taylor Swift post. And the new thing I have there, even though that feels like it was a lifetime ago, it was only a few weeks ago, uh, we actually have hard data in some battleground states, including Pennsylvania, where we're able to see the data from after Taylor Swift made her endorsement. And what we actually saw is that 80, there was an 88% increase in Democrats registering to vote in that time period, and an 8% decrease in Republicans <laughs> registering to vote, which I don't know what exactly to make of that other than that's a pretty big intensity gap. 61% of the new registrants in Pennsylvania during that three-day period after that debate and the endorsement were under the age of 30. If you looked at the same time period in 2020, it was only 45% under 30. So that's pretty cool. The other big spike that's happened since the last time we spoke was National Voter Registration Day. Uh, Massive increase in voter registrations. 
seen good things in places like North Carolina. Um, and then the last thing, I, I have to share some positive news in general. We've seen uh, the news that in the Senate, they're now spending money in Florida, in Texas, and looking at those races. A lot of people have taken that as a pivot away from Montana. It is very much not, as we know, they've spent basically all the money you can spend there to a certain degree. I looked at Native American voter registrations in Montana and found this huge increase over the last two months in Montana among Native Americans registering to vote. Again, since Vice President Harris became the nominee, also you just happen to have a Republican Senate candidate there who is saying incredibly racist things about Native Americans. So it sort of adds up. So the voter registration data is still looking great. Again, the early votes just starting to come in, but the early signs in the early vote are positive. It'll take a little bit before we get enough data to really know, but yeah, lots of good news in that data. Neither one of these people there, Simon, could run something called the Hopium Chronicles. Neither, <laughs> I mean, they're both like trying to be kind of optimistic, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's going to rely on you to say, you know, this. Try, just try this on for size. Uh, why you'd rather be us than them? <laughs> um, oh, so many reasons, David. Right. I mean, uh, we all know that in our hearts, we would all much rather be us than them. Right. For all the obvious reasons. But let's talk about the political reasons. <laughs> yeah. Look, the, the polling continues to be, you know, very stable and consistent, almost remarkably so. Usually in polling, there's wide variances. It's just the nature of how data works. That's not really happening right now. I mean, everything is sort of coming back three to four, five points ahead for Harris and national polling. We continue to be in slightly better shape than the Republicans in the battlegrounds. We're definitely closer to 270 because of the strength that we have in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and in the blue dot in Nebraska. And so, you know, I think that right now, today, we head into this home stretch in better shape. We're winning the election, but we haven't won it yet. And now we have to use these advantages that we have in money and in field and in enthusiasm to go push this election closer to us and to not allow them to push it closer to them. And I think that we have more tools to do that. And so I think just the general assessment, without overthinking this very much, is that we just have a stronger and more popular team. You know, our two candidates are consistently in faves and unfaves and favorability, polling in positive territory, which is unusual. Um, we're much more popular than they are. And so, and our team is much stronger and we can close much stronger. And so just on that basic assessment, David, it's just more likely that we win than them. Um, but, you know, elections throw things in our way. We had storm come up through Georgia and North Carolina. We may have a dock worker strike. We may have a war in the Middle East. There's a lot of things that could derail or disrupt the current path, but they may not either. And certainly one of the most interesting things, and I'll end, is that you know, usually at this point, we have at least one or two more presidential debates. It's been very common for the last 40, 50, 60 years, and we don't have that. And so now what it means for everyone here is that we've got to generate some of that intensity ourselves. The, the supporters for Kamala Harris need to recognize that she's going to need a little bit more help perhaps than in the past because she doesn't have one of the central tools that a presidential campaign usually has in the end, which are these debates, which are seen by large numbers of people. Um, and because Trump is a baby man and a coward and he won't, he's, he got his ass kicked in the last debate and he's unwilling to sit down and do another one. And so I think that it also means, though, that they have fewer tools to fundamentally change the trajectory of the election than they might otherwise, which, again, all of that put it together. I'd much rather be us than them. And I think it is more likely that we win. But we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, we have more money, right? We have more people on the ground, right? I mean, those things matter too, right? Tara's very good on this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to defer to Tara. Tara, that's what I meant. Tara, we have more <laughs> money, right? We, we have more people on the ground. We have more money. We have more people on the ground. We have a better ground game. No question. 
we are outspending um, Trump, uh, definitely on digital by an insane amount, um, less so, but I believe still true in the battleground states or most of them on television. Um, and so we're, we're definitely in a position of strength in terms of resources and infrastructure. Um, I, I forget where I was talking about this the other day. It was probably with Simon. Um, the odds are good, but just about kind of the, the shell of a Trump campaign, really, um, that we're seeing. They're not running a really, really strong campaign when it comes to outreach um, to voters. They're relying heavily on earned media overpaid which is very different than past Trump campaigns. So um, there's, there's a lot uh, to be just hopeful about. Um, I think really the nerves that are setting in is just because the map is changing in a very good way and just kind of monitoring and seeing, you know, where are we gonna pull off um, uh, those 270 plus votes and where is the most confidence. And honestly, when I feel the most hopeful and confident is when I am talking to people on the ground in these states. And it's making me very itchy to get to some of these battlegrounds and actually um, roll up my sleeves and do some canvassing as well, because that's really where the energy is. That's where the work is. That's where it's going to uh, it's going to come down to the finish line. And I think that that is where we have a much stronger presence in general. And what's going to matter much more is getting all of these people who are on the fence about whether or not they vote actually out and out early where early voting is. Um, so we can see those numbers tick up and also so we can just have a higher sense of confidence of focusing on everyone else who might not be at the top of those lists or those cues for the canvassing. So we can really make this the landslide I think that we, we could and should have, especially in some of these states that often are too close to call. Um, I hope that they're not. I hope that that's, that's what I'm aiming for at this stage is is making sure that we win all of the battlegrounds that we can and not just focus on three plus plus the blue dot in Nebraska, which we should talk yeah, about. Yeah, but just don't pick up on Simon's downer perspective on Nebraska. <laughs> is it not the case that the Republican senatorial candidate is behind there to an independent? It is. Miraculously? That it's not a just a blue dot. It's not. The blue dot is getting bigger. It's we, getting, uh, ex exactly. It's Simon getting... and I just had a conversation with Jane Club uh, earlier today. So for our series, but yeah, no, it's it's really exciting. They're, they have made the Senate race competitive. There are some really competitive House races there. Um, they're focused on state legislature. They have a ton of resources because of Hopium and Simon's work supporting them. It's very exciting to see really grassroots energy turn um, a traditionally red state into a battleground this cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And I and by the way, I, I'll come to you in a minute, Simon, of course, but all credit to you and the Hopium community for the amount of money that you've raised. Um, I was, it's a very, very, what was it, a million dollars in the last week of September? Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, no, I'm going <laughs> to, when this collection's over, we are going to start doing fundraising for podcasting companies. <laughs> um, uh, Tom, Tom uh, yeah, I, I think because of the experience that we all had uh, together in 2022. A lot of people are looking with great interest at early voting. And but the question I have for you is, when do those numbers really become uh, 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 rich enough to, 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 to say, say things about the election that, that, that are meaningful. I mean, we're in the very early stages of it. Is it two weeks from now? Is it three weeks from now? What, what's the, what, how do you look at that? I mean, it, it's basically a curve where the closer we get to the election, the more confidence we can have in the findings. So even now in some States, there's enough data to at least begin to see some directional elements. I mean, to me, the big questions that we're looking at in the early vote, and really one of the biggest pro problems, I should back up and say there's way more bad early vote analysis out there than good. Um, the data is becoming more accessible. There are more people who are just kind of throwing out their hot takes on the early vote data. By itself, it's not super useful. It's why we created this target early site that is publicly available. So people can have access not just to the current cycle data, but to look at the historic context, which in my mind is the most important with the caveat that right now the historic context is 2020, which is not the best baseline because it was a pandemic and voting was so much more accessible. So it makes the analysis more complicated. So to your question, more data 
will allow us to have more confidence in those findings. But like Virginia is a great example. Virginia has more votes reported now than any other state. Normally, I don't think we'd really be talking about Virginia in the presidential contest. It, it got a Senate race there that is not going to be competitive. But Republicans have been trying to sell this idea for like months now that they could win Virginia. They even had some polls that suggested that Trump could win before President Biden dropped out. And a few even since then. So we've got over 300,000 votes cast there. We can draw some conclusions. Republicans are looking at it and saying, well, look, we're doing better in the early vote than we were at this point in 2020. I look a little bit more closely at it and find that one out of four uh, Republican early voters in Virginia vote in on election day last time around. So what that tells me is what we already knew. Republicans are actually spending some money trying to convert their election day voters. They're actually maybe listening to Simon and his vote on day one campaign. It's a benefit to the campaign. It is not, however, a sign of intensity and enthusiasm, which is what Republicans are lacking at this point. So, you know, that's how I look at it. More states are coming online. I would say by next week at this time, we will have enough data in places like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin has a pretty substantial turnout already, where we'll be able to look at them and draw some more solid conclusion. Last point I'll make on this. What I really pay attention to in the early vote is looking at uh, first time voters and low propensity voters. We're looking for Democrats to have an advantage among those voters because those aren't the voters who we would otherwise expect to turn out. They're the best voters to get a sense of which side has more intensity and enthusiasm. And is everything that we're seeing in the voter registration data in special election over performances in the polls, is that playing out in actual votes? That'll be a really good, it was certainly a good sign in 2022. It was a good indicator that there wouldn't be a red wave. I expect that to be a good indicator this time around as well. Okay. Simon, what's your battleground report? Well, I think, you know, we're having a major event today that I, that I think matters in the election. And I vote, you know, we've spoken here many times about what it would mean if Liz Cheney and these prominent Republicans not just endorsed Kamala Harris, but started campaigning with her and the visual, you know, the idea. And so today, Kamala Harris and Liz Cheney are going to rip on Wisconsin, the, the home, the founding home of the Republican Party. And it's going to be a fascinating event. And we're going to have a conversation about the fact that the Republican Party of Reagan and Lincoln is now drifted into becoming a party of a far of the far right uh, nationalism, fascism, whatever the words are we want to use, that ideologically it is essentially rejected and turned on the origins and the modern evolution of the conservative party that many of us knew as younger people. And and she's going to potentially be making a very powerful case, one of the most powerful cases you could make for why people should abandon the party that she grew up in in this election. And I think this stuff really matters. I mean, I, I think this is an important, you know, yes, it's on the margins, a half a point or a point, but there's also a bigger story here, right? And elections are about narratives and memes and people touch a only a few things, right? How's, you know, healthcare doing? How's the economy doing? This issue that there's something wrong with the Republican Party and their candidate and their two candidates. Because I think one of the, I have a, my own feeling, and we'll see, is that part of the reason this event is happening today, and they only announced it this morning, was the combination of Vance's just odious, god-awful, insulting, you know, historically infamous performance on Tuesday night, uh, and the, the Jack Smith filing on Wednesday, where we, it, Trump's attempt to overturn our democracy and install a dictatorship was sort of thrown in our face in a very powerful way. And I think Liz Cheney is ready to rumble here, right? She views Trump and Vance, both of them, Ted Cruz too, because she's campaigning against Ted Cruz in, in Texas, views them as a material threat to the country. And she's working every... And so I, I think this is an important moment in the election today. And it's, and you know, hats off to the campaign. I do think the campaign, our campaign, the harris Walls campaign, as I was saying earlier, is going to have to do things to fill some of the space that's been that has been left by the lack of presidential debates. They did it with this Oprah event. They've done it with some of her big speeches and her rallies that are sort of breaking through beyond the normal thing. This event today, I think, is going to have legs. I think this is going to be like a, a moment in the campaign 
that is going to be really important. And, and I think it also creates permission structure. While she's there, there's going to be two dozen prominent Republicans in Wisconsin endorsing Kamala Harris. And, you know, this stuff, guys, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, the, the level of rebellion by Republicans against Trump is unprecedented in modern political history. And I think it matters. And, and, and so I think it's going to matter throughout all seven of these states. And look, if we're if these are all in margin of error, if we're up by two to three points, right, we're now looking for ways to grow a half a point here or there, right? Push the youth vote up a little bit, do a little bit better with Hispanics, right? Peel off some of these Republicans, drive the abortion issue, which pushes away suburbanites, right, away from the Republican. We're firing on all these cylinders simultaneously to sort of narrow target, you know, half a percent here, or a percent here. But that can add up to two or three points, right? I mean, this stuff is really deeply meaningful. And the campaign has enough money to do a lot of research to allow them to do a degree, a degree of targeting, of messaging that is often passed outside the ability of a campaign to do. And they also have the media capacity to then develop narratives and stories and media to speak to these narrow opportunities. And I just think, I just want to say, somebody who's been doing this for a long time, I think this is a remarkable campaign. I mean, it, it, they are, they are, what they were handed and the degree of difficulty of what they were handed was very high. And I think they're being highly creative and doing a really interesting job. And one of the things Tara, you know, talks about is how, you know, we were in a deficit on social media. I think we're now on the front foot on social media. I mean, they've really, they've done a really good job. And it's another reason why I sort of am relentlessly optimistic because when I look at their Star Wars bar campaign and I look at their, the, frankly, the shit show that their thing is over there, I just feel like we've got a very mature, sophisticated thing on our side that's executing at a high level. And they got like a rundown pickup truck, right, that the, the tires are falling off. And, and it just means that we're just much more likely to win. Um, hmm. Never heard you say that. Oh, no, I always hear you say that. But... <laughs> But, um, but, but, because but, David, it's true. No, no, David, I know you, it's true. That's but David, you wouldn't. Doing. I know you wouldn't want me to mislead your listeners, no, right? I mean, no, I, I, that's I, why they're here is to hear the truth. <laughs> I want to hear some expanded metaphors, though. I've got the Star Wars bar and the pickup truck. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. I'm so. I know, I know. I got it. We're just playing here, you know. I, I mean, like this is. Both of those yeah. Okay. Not, Star Wars bar is an important part of my the understanding. Mos Eisley Cantina. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah. Mos Eisley Cantina. Yeah. No, it's, it's, and Tara's like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> um, but you know, it's okay. The older people listen to you, Simon, and they follow you. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, by the way, I will offer just the slightest bit of news insight into what you just said. I don't know if you anybody listened to Cassidy Hutchison on. Morning Joe this morning, uh, but she actually endorsed Kamala Harris and said she was voting for her. She had not said that until now. The reason she had not said that until now is that she was working with Liz Cheney's PAC, uh, as were several other women who had been in the Trump administration, and Liz Cheney told them not to. And she lifted that essential block on, on saying that uh, in the past 24, 48 hours. So it, it it jibes with what Simon is saying, and it there is sort of growing momentum on that front. Um, but Tara, you know, it does, I, I think this issue of what do you put where the debate went? How do you build that kind of enthusiasm um, is one of the big issues because, you know, you particularly want to be energized with two weeks to go where there's usually a debate, what what should they be doing? Well, I, first, I want to actually underscore what you said about Cassidy Hutchins and, um, and Liz Cheney coming out, because I think to Simon's point about how this election is going to come down to really, 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 really scary thin margins, probably in a lot of the states, Trump's whole game right now is that he has to keep people home more than he can peel them off into his corner to be able to get the votes that he needs. And the Harris Walls campaign has this incredible strong advantage to both need to obviously turn out as many people who would never vote for Trump, but would vote for their ticket as possible, but also to bring out really, really, really big guns like Liz Cheney, et cetera, who may be able to actually still persuade some soft Trump supporters 
But even more importantly, and I'm just, this is going to sound very crass, but talking about January 6th more, having these Republicans come out who worked in the Trump administration or who were lifelong Republicans um, in elected office and otherwise talking about the dangers to democracy and what Trump, re Trump represents may also keep some folks home in the Republican Party, which would also help those margins. And we saw I, that in the pandemic as well in 2020. Let, let me just interject something there, but, but particularly while you're speaking, because I think you would have resonated with you. But in the middle of Cassidy Hutchinson's thing, she was asked a little bit about why people, others in the party, didn't step up. And she made this very telling comment that the women were stepping up, but that the men in the party were not stepping up. And I just thought that was a fascinating... I mean, does that surprise anyone at all? Isn't that just true in any, <laughs> in any situation regarding... <laughs> Certainly, it's certainly, like it's um, certainly true here. But I'm sure you're going to win this election. Women are women are also, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have a woman uh, running the country very soon. So it is, uh, it's another year of the women for sure. But that, no, it's absolutely true. And something else I was going to bring up relevant to that is something else that's really cool that's happening pretty organically is that women in battleground states are putting post-its in the uh, stalls of uh, public restrooms in the women's bathrooms, telling them um, in these handwritten, lovely post-it notes, reminding them that who they vote for is not public, it is private. So, because there are a lot of women, especially white suburban women, um, who do not feel uh, that they can cross their husbands or the men in their lives. Uh, folks hear it at the doors all the time. And so these post-its are popping up everywhere and who knows the efficacy of them, but it's a very personal and grassroots thing. And we know how powerful postcards are. And it's just a reminder that their vote is private. And so I think that's the other thing when we get to talking about the polling that we don't really know, because we also know that a lot of people will answer a poll a very different way sometimes than they will actually cast their ballot. I think that's also true for young people. Um, and so that, you know, that's where a lot of my nerves come from. I have a lot of hope, et cetera, but we really don't know anything. 2020 was a very unique situation because of the pandemic. And as Tom pointed out earlier, how voting was more accessible in, in many, many ways. Um, voting laws have changed in some states. We have hand counted ballots in states like Georgia that we actually won and helped be our firewall in 2020. So there's a lot we don't know, but I do think that there is a lot of energy and a lot of movement happening that is going to have people turn out or not who are not being represented in that way in the polls. And that that does give me a sense of hope and a sense of excitement to see that. Um, when it comes to the, the VP debate and debates generally, your question, David, I don't really know that debates actually are the huge source of um, energy and excitement that maybe they once were. Um, certainly not to folks my age or younger. I don't think that they've mattered as much. I think they're important in the scheme of things. But actually, I, I do think that more culturally resonant um, moments and events like the Oprah event, like I'm sure we're going to start to see a flood of celebrities come out and endorse in the final weeks and show up at the rallies for Harris Walls. Um, campaign, that will matter to young people. Um, it really will. I think we're all waiting to see if Beyonce is actually going to come out beyond giving her song over, um, as Taylor Swift did. But we know that there's going to be a whole slew of folks who end up actually in the battleground states in the final weeks. And that's going to really matter to get people who are the couch sitters or who don't uh, you know, think that their vote matters so much engaged in a way that makes them want to be a part of it. Um, and we're going to have a lot more, um, I think, visually to see that is going to kind of catalyze more of that energy and enthusiasm um, that has to carry us over. Yeah. And I think Russell Brand will move a lot of psychotic Brits towards Trump. <laughs> um, uh, but but of course, you know, they can't vote, probably um, not this time around anyway. Um, uh, Tom, I, I know you specialize in in some of the non poll things, but. You know, Tara brings up this point. We don't, we don't know for sure, but it seems pretty likely you'll have more Republicans not voting for Trump, not voting or voting for Harris than we've seen in a recent election, that there will be more shift there. We also know from your information that you're likely to have a bunch of voters who don't show up in the pollsters' radar. You know, young voters who who wouldn't have voted before, uh, other other others who wouldn't have become engaged to become engaged, um, and so, like when I look at it, 
you know, I'm looking at the polls and it's saying R plus three or whatever it is. And I'm thinking, well, that's probably wrong by this much. And so I have to adjust it. How do you look? I mean, how do you read it? Like what, what, what sort of calculus is going on in your brain as you're doing it? Yeah, it, it's actually not that complicated. It's similar to what you described because, again, let's all keep in mind that every pollster, when they create a likely voter sample, they make a decision of what turnout is going to look like. They have to. That's what a likely voter sample is. And most pollsters, from what I can tell, are being extremely cautious because they're aware that the polls in 2020 and 2016 overrepresented Democratic support. So when we see polls coming out from respectable pollsters who are suggesting that the electorates in these battleground states will be more Republican than they were in 2020, even though in every single election we've seen that has taken place since the Dobbs decision, the electorates have not only been more Democratic, they've been substantially more Democratic. And then to the point that Tara made a moment ago, we've actually seen much more crossover voting both in ballot initiatives like in Kansas, where somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of registered Republicans voted no on the Republican uh, anti-abortion rights amendment, similar numbers in Ohio and Montana and around the country, uh, but also in partisan races where we've seen Trump clone candidates in the Senate in 2022 lose spectacularly. So when I look at these polls, I look at that in the context, just like the early vote. If their likely voter sample is suggesting that the electorate in Pennsylvania will be more Republican than it was in 2020, and we see all of the evidence of what the electorates have looked like there since 2020, I'm going to make, I'm not going to go in and unskew the polls and say, well, this says that we're down one, actually we're up three. I just look at that and say, well, let's put that in the box of less plausible scenarios. It's something that theoretically could happen. So now we know that's helpful. If Republicans turn out at a higher rate than we do and we did last time, that's what it looks like. Am I confident it's going to look like that? Not at all. And so I, I, my pet peeve, I wish polls would generally be presented in the public and by the media where they actually give that context and say, well, here's the what if scenario that's presented in our poll. Here's the evidence that you can use to conclude whether or not you think it will be uh, uh, reflective of that. And then, you know, I, I think people would actually be more satisfied with the polls in the end, or at least less surprised when they missed by so much. It's a really, really good point. Uh, I don't want to get too far down in the weeds, Simon, since you have a big, big, broad perspective and take it wherever you want. But as I was driving here, I was listening to the head of the North Carolina Democratic Party saying, uh, we don't know how this hurricane is going to affect the ability of people in North Carolina to vote. Uh, and there are going to be consequences in Georgia and in Florida, too. That strikes me as a more plausible October surprise than anything else that people have talked about in terms of something that, A, could actually have an impact on, on, on the results, and B, will almost inevitably be used by the Republicans to say, the result was wrong if they don't like it. Um, yeah. So so I'm just wondering what yeah. your thoughts are. So it's why what Tara said earlier is so important is that we have to try to win all these states. I mean, we have to win all seven states. We have to run up the score as much as we can. We need to blow it out in the early vote. This This thing just has to feel as much as possible like a definitive victory. And not something that is we're squeaking over the finish, you know, stumbling over the finish line at the end, um, which means that the the bigger the electoral college margin is, you know, if Trump claims that North Carolina was rigged somehow and we have enough electoral college votes that it doesn't matter, then it's less important. Right. I mean, the answer to a lot of the worry that people have is we just have to work as hard as we possibly can and get as many votes as we can and, and run up the score as much as we can to make it harder for them to claim whatever it is that they're going to claim. I mean, I, I you know, I there, there is some history in sort of reestablishing voting mechanisms. The good thing is, as Anderson Clayton, I saw her on MSNBC last night, talked about that in North Carolina, the Board of Elections is actually a functional nonpartisan thing and that she's optimistic that they're going to be able to do a good job at giving people opportunities. My guess is the federal government will come in and backstop some of those costs as part of the FEMA 
rebuild. We'll see what happens. I mean, those things, there's complexity to that. Same as in Georgia, same as in Florida. But I think the point you raised, I, I want to just in, in a moment of non-hopium, right, but in a moment of pragmatism, is that I just think there is such an incentive now for Trump and greater MAGA to try to disrupt and create things that, you know, change the trajectory of an election that Trump is currently losing, right? And whether it's the longshoreman strike or whether you think BB is pushing the region towards war, which is going to drive up oil prices, gas prices here, or 87 other things that we can't anticipate, there's now a reason for greater MAGA to kind of pull the fire alarm. This guy's not winning the election. He's a terrible candidate. He's making unbelievable mistakes. His VP is odious and loathsome and just a drag on their ticket. And so I think that just like they learned in 2016 that extraordinary things can change the trajectory of an election they're losing, I think that we should anticipate that they now have an incentive to try to disrupt. And I don't mean to do this to freak people out, but I also think that we should be open to the idea that there could be extraordinary things happen in the next month. And again, what do we do about that? Well, we run up the score. We win the election by as much as we can, you know, in order to to make any of these things they attempt to be less, you know, much less likely to be successful. But I am worried. I am uh, growing a little concerned because I hope we don't worry. We do more and worry less at Hopium. Is that um, that the is this a there, cult? <laughs> not yet not yet not yet um, um no i i don't there's one cult in american politics is maga and then david we're the antidote to that I right? we're a cult a cultish antidote and so anyway i just i just think that there's going to be now if they haven't pulled the fire alarm internally in greater maga that it's they are going to pull it because this guy's losing the election you know, I turn, I rely on you guys to lift my spirits, particularly with 32 days to go, because I'm as anxious as you are. And, and you've said a lot of very comforting things that I'm going to write down and repeat to myself as I go to sleep, saying, repeating also the little hopey and prayer we've all been given. Um, and uh, I got to say, though, I'm feeling a little anxious right now. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm w working on this every single day, but I'm not going to, I, I mean, I'm doing stuff every single day, all day long almost, uh, but it's a different kind of stuff than you're doing. It's, it's, you know, dealing with reporters and, and other kinds of groups. Uh, I, I'm, you know, in conjunction with the campaign, but um, we'll have you back in a couple of weeks and, uh, I, you know, your assignment is to like feel better, you know, like get more enthusiastic, um, you know, come back with some hard data that'll make us feel, cause I want, you know what, I, I'm really looking forward to a podcast on like November 6th, where we go and replay Simon going where we shouldn't be eking this out. We should get 55% of the vote. <laughs> and I, I want to come back and say, see, Simon said this here. He said it here <laughs> first. And that's what happened. OK, so that's, that's let's that's your lips goal. to God's ears, David. Let's, let's and, record a few and, takes now. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, I want to just do something you always ask. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to remind everybody that when you vote early, you create bigger Democratic turnout and you help make it more likely that we win. One of the other things that Unless, David, you're going to go around the room. No, no. But, but we need – I just want to remind everyone that as early voting is now kicking in all across the country, that when you vote early, you pull yourself off the GOTV rolls and you allow the campaign to start targeting lower propensity voters earlier. And that creates more Democrats, increases our turnout, makes it more likely we win. So there's one more way that you can take a punch at the fascists, and it's by – voting as early as you can during your early vote window, however you vote. It's really important. You know, as I say in the Hopium community, our goal should be to win this election in October, not in November, to run up the score in the early vote and to make it impossible for them to catch up. And so there's a lot we can all do, but one of the things that is easy is just voting as early as you can when the early vote comes to your state. 
Super important. Is there like a secret hopium handshake or something that you guys have? <laughs> it's, 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 it's turning into something I, I frankly didn't expect and, and, and find a, a little frightening. But yeah. um, but doing good work. Uh, as are you all. So thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Simon. Talk to you in a few days. Uh, good luck, everybody. And we'll be back with more each and every day. Bye-bye. Thank you, David.